Before we start today's video, we want to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, The Ridge. For years, I used a leather wallet and I'd stuff it full of receipts and coupons that I'd never use. But now I use a carbon fiber wallet from The Ridge and I'll never go back to a leather wallet. Ridge wallets just have so many more advantages over leather wallets. They have a sleek design, but they can still carry up to 12 cards and my money. Because of the wallet's minimalist design, it easily fits into any of my pockets. Ridge wallets also have RFID blocking, so I know my cards will stay safe. Ridge wallets also look cool, and they have so many designs, so you're bound to find one that matches your personality. I'm not the only one who loves my Ridge wallet. They have over 30,000 five-star reviews. Right now, the Ridge is offering criminally listed viewers 10% off with free worldwide shipping and returns. Just go to ridge.com slash listed. That's ridge.com slash listed. And use the promo code listed in the description box. Get yourself the best wallet you'll ever own and help support criminally listed by checking out ridge.com slash listed. Number three, Sean Emmett. In early 2003, Sean Emmett and Jacqueline Howell were in a relationship. They lived in Carfilly, which is a town in South Wales. Emmett and Jacqueline had both previously been married, and they both had children. Jacqueline's two daughters lived with her and Emmett. By February 2003, they had been living together for about 16 months, and they had talked about marriage. But the relationship was far from ideal. Emmett used drugs, including amphetamines, so his behavior was erratic at times. He was also incredibly jealous. He was convinced that Jacqueline was having an affair with her ex-husband, Andrew Howell, who went by the name Patty. Sometime at the end of February 2003, Jacqueline ended the relationship with Emmett. St. David is the patron state of Wales, and his feast date is March 1st. On February 27th, 2003, 29-year-old Jacqueline Howell attended a St. David's Day concert at her children's school. That evening, she went out. Sadly, she did not return home. Five days later, her body was found in an unoccupied flat in Carfilly. The mother of two had been stabbed 39 times. Written in blood beside her body in the carpet was the name Patty. The police quickly determined who killed Jacqueline and it wasn't her ex-husband, Patty. Instead, they believed that the killer was her estranged boyfriend, 31-year-old Sean Emmett. The main reason they thought that Emmett was the killer was because the flat where Jacqueline was killed was being leased by Emmett. After the murder, Emmett had fled to Cardiff. The police tracked him down and arrested him. The police were then able to determine what happened on the night of the murder. Emmett was angry that Jacqueline had ended the relationship. He was also convinced that Jacqueline was having an affair with her ex-husband even though there was no evidence that they were romantically involved after their divorce in 2001. Emmett was able to lure Jacqueline to the flat and then he stabbed her to death. Emmett had planned on killing himself as well. He swallowed some pills to cut his wrists and then he changed his mind. He wrote Patty in blood to make it look like Jacqueline was identifying her attacker as she lay dying. Emmett went to trial a little less than a year after the murder in January 2004. He was found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 14 years. Emmett first applied for parole four years ago. His current whereabouts are unknown. Number 2 John Calvarisi and Michael Bootlin. In 1982, David Lutz was 16 years old, and he was living in Reading, Pennsylvania. One day, he came across a 36-year-old man named Stanley Detweiler in the city square. Lutz and Detweiler started talking, 
and it was the beginning of their friendship. Lutz had never been close to his own father, and he considered Detweiler a father figure. Over the next five years, Lutz would live with Detweiler for a few months at a time. Lutz was openly bisexual. Detweiler was a deeply religious man, and he struggled with his sexuality. Five years after they first met, in the summer of 1987, Detweiler was living a lonely existence. He was single, and he was living in an apartment with Lutz. Detweiler worked as a maintenance man at a hotel, and he tuned pianos. Detweiler never really went out much, and he didn't have much of a social life. He went to work, he would go out for walks by himself, and sometimes he would go to a local McDonald's where he would talk to people about God. On the night of July 24th, 1987, David Lutz went out to a bar. At 3 a.m., he was heading home and he was walking with a friend. As they were walking, they encountered a teenage boy who asked Lutz for a match. Lutz started talking to the young man who said his name was Mike. Lutz invited Mike back to the apartment that he shared with Detweiler. He told Mike that they had an expensive stereo system and a lot of money in the apartment. Mike started walking back to the apartment with Lutz. But when they were about a block from the apartment building, Mike decided he didn't want to go to the apartment. Lutz thought that Mike seemed like a nice guy, so he gave him his address. They split up, and Lutz went home alone. The next night, Lutz went out again. He returned to his apartment building at about 3.30 a.m. When he got to the door of his apartment, he immediately saw that something was wrong. The door had been kicked in. Lutz then got inside the apartment. What he found was a scene from a horror movie. The dead body of 41-year-old Stanley Detweiler was on the floor of the living room. He had been decapitated. On one of the walls, someone had written LSD in blood. They had also written Red Rum, which is murder spelled backward. Reed Dumb was also written on one of the walls and his thought that the killer misspelled Red Rum. The police noted that the character Danny wrote Red Rum on a door in the movie The Shining, which is based on the Stephen King book of the same name. The Shining had just been broadcast on television a few days before the murder. The police found Detweiler's wallet in one of his pockets, so they did not think that robbery was the motive. Instead, they thought that he might have been killed because he was involved in a love triangle. The police first suspected that David Lutz was the killer. But he denied killing Detweiler, and he took a polygraph exam, which he passed. Lutz then told the police about the encounter he had with the young man named Mike about 24 hours before he found Detweiler's dead body. The problem was that Lutz didn't know Mike's last name. But it turned out that when he met Mike, he was with a friend, and the friend knew Mike. He told the police that the young man was 16-year-old Michael Bootlin. On July 29th, the police arrested Bootlin. Bootlin told them he knew who killed Detweiler. It was his 22-year-old friend, John Calaverisi. Calaverisi was arrested later that same day. Both Bootlin and Calaverisi were charged with first-degree murder. In March 1988, Calaverisi pleaded guilty but mentally ill to first-degree murder. The next month, he was sentenced to life in prison. Bootlin went to trial in August 1988. Despite being 16 at the time of the murder, he was being tried as an adult. Bootlin's defense was that he didn't commit the actual murder, 
and he was just an unwitting accomplice. He had no idea that Calgarisi was going to kill Debt Wheeler. In fact, he thought that the murder was unnecessary because when they got into the apartment, it was dark and Debt Wheeler wouldn't have been able to see their faces. He was also apparently afraid of Calvarisi. Calvarisi testified at Budlin's trial and he explained what happened that night. Calvarisi said that he and Butlin had been drinking and Butlin smoked some marijuana. Butlin told him about meeting David Lutz and they decided to rob his apartment. They went over to the apartment and kicked in the door. Detweiler was asleep on the couch and he rushed to the door. Once they were inside the apartment, Calvarisi pushed Detweiler to the floor and Bootlin repeatedly kicked him in the head. Calvarisi testified that he went into the kitchen and grabbed a 10-inch butcher knife. He then got on top of Detweiler. Calvarisi said he asked Bootlin if he should cut his throat or cut his head off. Bootlin said, go ahead. Detweiler tried to grab the knife, but Bootlin stepped on his arm. Calabrese said he started sawing Detweiler's neck and then twisted the head off. Afterward, he wrote LSD on one of the walls because it was his favorite drug. He clarified that he wasn't high that night and he was only drunk. Calabrese testified that he wrote Redumb as a short form for the words real dumb. Calabrese admitted that he knew that there was something wrong with him because, as he testified, you just don't go around cutting people's heads off for nothing. Bulin's trial lasted for a week and the jury deliberated for three and a half hours. He was found guilty and he was given an automatic life sentence without the chance of parole. In July 2015, John Calvarisi died at the age of 50 in prison from natural causes. In 2012, the Supreme Court ruled that automatic life sentences without the chance of parole for juveniles was cruel and unusual punishment. Therefore, they were unconstitutional. In 2016, the Supreme Court made the decision retroactive. So in October 2017, 30 years after he was convicted, Michael Bootlin was given a new sentence. He was sentenced to 40 years to life. He'll be able to apply for parole in 2027 when he's 56 years old. Currently, Michael Bootlin is serving a sentence at SCI Smithfield in Huntingdon, Pennsylvania. Number 1. Alan Schoenborn Merritt is a small town in the south central area of British Columbia's interior. In 2008, the city had a population of only 7,000 people. The city is most famous for an annual country music festival. Because of the popularity of the festival, there are many country music activities and attractions in the city. For that reason, Merritt is billed as the country music capital of Canada. In October 2007, Darcy Clark moved into a mobile home in the city with her three children, 10-year-old Caitlin, 8-year-old Max, and 5-year-old Corden. At the time, Darcy and the father of the children, Alan Schoenborn, weren't together. She and Alan had been together for 15 years, but they never got married. A significant problem with their relationship was that Alan abused drugs and alcohol. When Darcy moved into the mobile home with the children, Alan was in recovery. They had been through several rocky years together. Darcy had even got a protective order against Alan. Alan was not allowed to see her or the kids if he had been drinking within the last 12 hours. He was also supposed to leave the home if she told him to go. Alan had a history of mental illness. 
Two decades earlier, he was admitted to a psychiatric hospital for the first time after a bad LSD trip. One time, when his eldest child, Caitlin, was 16 months old, he was driving with her in his vehicle. He claimed that he could not wake Caitlin up and he thought she was in a drug-induced coma. So he sped towards the hospital, but he ended up crashing his vehicle. It turned out that there was nothing wrong with Caitlin. Alan ended up being placed in a psychiatric hospital for 10 days after the accident. In the spring of 2008, Alan and Darcy were still estranged. Alan split his time between Vancouver, where he worked as a roofer, and Merritt. When he was visiting Merritt, he would stay in the mobile home. But he and Darcy would frequently argue. So social services suggested that Darcy should stay at her mother's home when Alan was visiting with the children. The first week of April 2008 was not going well for Alan. He was arrested three times. One time it was for being drunk in public. Another time he was driving while prohibited. Alan was arrested a third time on April 3rd after he threatened a nine-year-old girl at her school which he attended with Alan's children. Alan said he became angry with the girl because he thought she was picking on his daughter. The principal intervened and Alan threatened the principal. Alan was released the next day on bail. The day after that, which was April 5th, Alan was going to spend the night with the children, so Darcy went to her mother's home. That day, Caitlin, Max, and Corden flew kites. Then they came inside and played games and watched some television. That night, Alan tucked them into bed. The next afternoon, Darcy came home and found the mobile home quiet. She walked in and saw her two sons lying on the couch. It looked like they were napping. But when Darcy got a closer look, she realized that 8-year-old Max and 5-year-old Corden were dead. She went and checked the two bedrooms. One bedroom was empty. In the other bedroom was the body of 10-year-old Caitlin. Like her brothers, she was also dead. Darcy immediately called the police. The area around the mobile home was searched, but Alan was gone. A massive manhunt for him was launched. The problem was that the area around Merritt is densely forested, so it made the search extremely difficult. While people searched for Alan, the police examined the crime scene. Max and Corden had been suffocated to death. On the kitchen wall close to their bodies, Alan wrote forever young in a brown liquid. It turned out to be soy sauce. Caitlin had been stabbed in the neck with a meat cleaver. On the pillow near her body, in blood, Alan wrote gone to Neverland. Alan was found by a trapper in some woods outside of Merritt on April 16th, 10 days after the murders. He had been hiding out in the woods near a tourist center. When he was found, he was nearly dead. He had attempted to kill himself by cutting his wrist with a razor, but he had failed. The attempt left one of his arms injured. He was taken to the hospital where his arm was bandaged and he was treated for dehydration. Alan Schoenborn went to trial a year and a half after the murders in October 2009. He pleaded not guilty by reason of mental disorder. The prosecution argued that Alan knew precisely what he was doing and he killed the kids in an act of revenge against Darcy for breaking up with him. At the trial, Darcy Clark testified. She said that Alan had a violent temper and they would argue often. 
She also said that Alan was an excellent father and never took his anger out on the children. Alan testified on his own behalf. He said he thought that his two sons were being sexually abused. He also thought that his daughter was being groomed for prostitution. There was no evidence that the children were being abused. Alan testified that he killed them because they would be in a better place if they were dead. He also detailed how he killed his children. He said they killed 10-year-old Caitlin first with a meat cleaver. Then he went into the master bedroom where the youngest child, 5-year-old Corden, was sleeping. He smothered him with a pillow. He then put a plastic bag over 8-year-old Max's head and suffocated him. After he was done, he washed Caitlin's body in the bathtub. He then put her body back in the bed and they put the boys' bodies on the couch. He wanted to make it look like they were sleeping when Darcy got home to lessen the shock when she found them dead. Alan also talked about his mental illness. He said it always felt like someone was watching him and people were whispering about him. He also said he heard voices in his head. He said he thought that the voices came from a transmitter that was in his nasal passage. Three psychiatrists testified and they all said that Alan had schizophrenia. Alan's trial, which didn't have a jury, lasted three months. He was ultimately found not criminally responsible by reason of mental disorder. He was sent to live in a psychiatric hospital in Coquitlam, British Columbia. It turned out that during the trial, Darcy Clark had moved to Coquitlam. After the murders, Darcy was obviously devastated and some people called her fragile. People who knew Darcy never really got the sense that she was mad at Alan. She always said he was a sick man but she was afraid of him. She was worried he would be given day release and she would bump into him. On May 30th, 2019, 11 years after the murders, 48-year-old Darcy Clark passed away. Her cause of death was never made public. Less than a year later, in March 2020, the courts granted Alan Schoenborn permission to take unsupervised trips out of the hospital. The trips can only be for a few hours and his visits must be approved by the hospital staff. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you found it interesting, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like it. Also, if you are looking for something new to watch, why not check out my new channel, Chapter Dark. The videos are mysteries that you can try and solve. Do you have what it takes to solve these mysteries? You can find a link to Chapter Dark in the description box below. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.